Well, the author T.S. Eliot, he uh, once said that humankind cannot bear very much reality. Um, I think you and I probably know that's true, don't we? Human beings are experts at avoiding the truth, at avoiding reality. When we don't like it, we try to change it. And sometimes uh, people do that in life so often that they even begin to deceive themselves. And about a year and a half ago, Mark Zuckerberg announced that Facebook was going to be rebranded. Um, this was to launch the metaverse. And the metaverse is a, an alternative reality that Zuckerberg believes will change, fundamentally change the way you and I interact. It's started already, we can put on specs. We can enter into another world. And while many people have got concerns about that, there are lots of people that find that thought very exciting. Avoiding truth, avoiding reality. Our passage tonight from the book of Proverbs is here, though, to help us live not in a fantasy world of our own creation, but in the real world, in God's world. I think these verses in chapter 24, they're a kind of reality check for us. Uh, before we jump into them, let me say two things as we begin. First, as we said last week, Proverbs is made up of a, a collection of sayings, lots of uh, different collections. It's not just kind of one thing after the other. And so if you look at the, the heading above verse 23, and uh, if you look at the way that verse 23 begins, um, it's clear this is one of those collections, isn't it? And it's the fourth of seven in the whole book. And yet, here's the second thing. Though this is a collection, a collection of different Proverbs, there's real variety too. I think we see the variety. If you look at the verses as a whole, at the way, look at how the scenes change in these verses. Okay, so verses 23 to 26, we've got a, a kind of court scene. There's judging, there's the need for honest speech. Then in verse 27, we're, we're on a farm, there's outdoor work to be done. Then in verse 28 to 29, we have more teaching about speech. And then in 30 to 34, we're back outside again. We meet the sluggard. And it kind of goes back and forth, doesn't it? Yeah, the teaching here is interwoven. It's inside, it's outside, it's inside, it's outside. And so as we come to these uh, verses, I'm just going to give you two headings. Here's the first. Here's the first point. And it's this. Don't distort the truth. Speak it. Don't distort the truth. Speak it. Look how the passage begins. There's a, a kind of principle, there's an example, and then there's a consequence. Partiality and judging is not good, that's the principle. And then the example, telling wicked people they're in the right. And then the consequences, being cursed by peoples, abhorred by nations. And partiality is favoritism, it's, it's prejudice, it has to do with the way you and I assess or, or make a judgment about somebody. And partiality is shown in our world all the time, isn't it? In business, in schools, in court, as our example shows, and in church. So listen to James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. Well, I won't read the rest of it, but James goes on to condemn those who discriminate, who become judges, who judge the poor man and exalt the wealthy man. James describes Jesus as glorious. And when you and I forget that, I think that's when we're tempted to show favoritism, isn't it? We let other people take that place. But look at this specific example in Proverbs. We're 
being warned in verse 24 not to call the wicked right. Whoever says to the wicked, you are in the right, will be cursed by peoples, abhorred by nations. Now, maybe you think, um, I'd never do that. I'd never call somebody who was wicked, I'd never say to them, you are in the right. Why do we need this warning? Uh, Jonathan School is uh, opposite a bowling club uh, in Invergowrie. I don't know if uh, anyone here has ever played bowls. Um, I can't claim to be an expert in bowls. Uh, but one of the things I know about a bowling ball is that it is hard to roll in a straight line, isn't it? It has a kind of bias in it. I think that's the technical term. It has a tendency to drift to one side. And you and I are like that, aren't we? We have a bias towards sin. Sin is not something that is just out there. No, sin is in each one of us. We're pulled around by it. And one of the ways we are, one of the ways we do is by distorting reality, distorting the truth. We say of the wicked, you are right. We call evil, evil behavior, good. We hear what God says, but you and I in lots of different ways every week, don't we? We make a different judgment. And yet, can you see the surprise in the second half of verse 24? I think if I'd written that verse, I would have said something like this, whoever says to the wicked, you're in the right, will be blessed by the world. And in one sense, that's right, isn't it? The Christian who is willing to call wicked behavior good, they will get a round of applause from the world, won't they? And we shouldn't isolate this text. We shouldn't say that this text here is saying all we need to know about human wickedness. No. But look at what the verse says. If we tell the wicked they're right, Proverbs says we will be cursed by peoples and abhorred by nations. One author says this uh, points to God's common grace. Human beings have within us a sense of right and wrong. We often, when we see injustice, when we see people getting off scot-free, how do we respond to somebody like that? I think of an example in a school, maybe, I don't know, abuse has taken place. And eventually it all comes out, and the school, if it comes out that the school governors knew all about it. They turned a blind eye. What's the response in that situation? It is absolute indignation, isn't it? And rightly so. You and I are not to call the wicked right. You and I are not to distort the truth. We are not to deceive with our words. I think that's what we're told in verse 28. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause. Now, human beings are experts at doing that, aren't we? We, we love to make stuff up about other people. We often lie or twist the truth. We, we can leave out inconvenient details, verse 29. What does the ninth commandment say? It says this, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Listen to how the, the shorter catechism unpacks the implications of that question. What is required in the ninth commandment? Answer, the ninth commandment requires the maintaining and promoting of truth between man and man and of our own and our neighbor's good name, especially in witness bearing. Question, what is forbidden in the ninth commandment? Answer, the ninth commandment forbids whatsoever is prejudicial to truth or injurious to our own or our neighbor's good name. See, you and I, we often want to get back at people, don't we? Verse 30. We often want to be judge, jury, and executioner when we speak about other people. And to be honest, the person who's never had that feeling has probably lived quite a sheltered life. 
And yet all of that is wrong, isn't it? God is the judge, not us. It is mine to avenge, he says. He has set a day when he will judge this world by the man he has appointed. And yet that doesn't mean that evil should go unchallenged. Look at verse 25. Those who rebuke the wicked will have delight and a good blessing will come upon them. Again, just think about God's common grace. I don't think we think about this enough. Because of common grace, evil is often punished. And state power can lead to evil. The book of Revelation makes that so clear, doesn't it? But God's Word also teaches that His common grace can be the means used to prevent and punish evil as well. And I think you and I should be very glad when that happens. We should be thankful. We should be thankful when the truth comes out. When criminals are jailed. When wrongs are put right. When people who've been oppressed are set free. When evil is overturned. Those are good things, and those are a little foretaste of the day God will make all things right. This passage is telling us, don't distort the truth, speak the truth. Live in line as Christians with what's right, with what's real. Look at verse 26, whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. A kiss is a sign of affection, a sign of respect, isn't it? And that's what our speech should be characterized by. You and I are not to try and create an alternative reality with our own words. That's what liars do, isn't it? Instead, our speech should be straight Our speech should be truthful. Our speech should be Christ-like. What does Jesus say? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Friends, is your speech like that? Would people say of you, he speaks plainly? Or would they say, you know, I am not always sure I am getting the whole truth with that person. Friends, let's pray that the the words we say to one another at St. Peter's would be honest. And that does not mean they will always be easy words. It does not mean we'll never have to say hard things. Honest words can be painful words to hear, and honest words can be very painful words to have to say to somebody too, can't they? Sometimes we can be too afraid to speak honestly, and so we need to ask God to help us in this area. Don't distort the truth. Speak the truth. Second heading, though, don't escape reality, embrace it. That's the second point. Don't escape reality, embrace it. One of the amazing things, the wonderful things about the Lord Jesus is the way that he taught. He he used all kinds of examples, didn't he, that, that resonated with people. He captured their imagination. He spoke about soil and banquets and treasure and trees, and light, and fruit, and camels, and mustard seed, and salt, and lots and lots of other things too. And Proverbs is like that, and possibly the most, uh, I think, famous individual in this book is the one we meet in verses 30 to 34, the sluggard. And uh, I have uh, a Bible, a kind of website I can look at and see how many times uh, different words come up uh, in books of the Bible and so on. The sluggard is mentioned 14 times. 
Okay, so the writers of this book, they, they, want us to show, they want to show us the danger of imitating him. Derek Kidner, one of the great commentators on Proverbs, he says, sluggards don't begin things, they don't finish things, they don't face things. He says they're restless, they're helpless, they're useless. And so before we look at our passage, 30 to 34, just glance across verse tw- chapter 26 and verse 13, I want to give you kind of four brush strokes, four little uh, glimpses of the sluggard. Look at verse 13. The sluggard says of chapter 26, sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. In other words, he sees threats that aren't there. And he uses that as an excuse not to take responsibility. Or the next verse, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. That kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Won't say any more. Verse 15, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. Here's someone whose whose laziness is is so tragic, it's almost comical. And yet the sluggard is not just lazy, the sluggard is also proud, verse 16. Look at it. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. The sluggard is somebody who can't be taught. Now look back at our passage, look at verses 30 to 34 for a little bit more about the sluggard. Uh, The speaker describes uh, walking past the sluggard's field, and it's more than just a field, it's it's a vineyard, it's not just some kind of flower garden or something like that, To, to let somewhere like that go to ruin would be bad, but this is worse. And it's worse because a vineyard is a place of potential. If you own a vineyard, if you're lucky enough to, to own one here this evening, uh, you will know that people who own them, they don't just grow grapes to put in their fruit salad, do they? No, they grow them so that they might be turned into something that costs quite a lot to buy, wine. Uh, they grow them, they have a vineyard to have a profit. And a vineyard can become a business, it can become a legacy, it can become a way of looking after future generations. A sluggard is totally unwilling to embrace that. A sluggard is unwilling to do the hard work that will enable him to enjoy blessing and bless his family, his descendants, and so on. Sluggard is only focused on the now. A few years ago, Marianne and I, we watched a a program on iPlayer uh, about a group of people who moved to Tuscany, which sounds fantastic, doesn't it? They they moved there to start working on a farm. Can't quite remember what it was called. It was on BBC Two. They all moved from the UK to live in this beautiful countryside on a big farm together. And they were going to try and see if they could make a living. And what they discovered was that farming is hard work. And they also discovered it was far more tempting to sit outside reading a book in the sunshine in Tuscany than doing the kind of work they needed to make it happen. The sluggard is like that. The sluggard lets things grow that shouldn't grow. Thorns and nettles are mentioned there, aren't they? He took naps when he shouldn't take naps. But what was the sluggard ultimately doing. I think we can sum it up in one word. Bruce Waltke, you've heard a lot from him in this sermon series. He, he showed me this this week. He says that the sluggard is someone who is escaping. It's escapism, isn't it? The, the sluggard teaches us the danger of wasting what we've been given. He shows how we can waste potential, but he also shows us the perils of escapism. And human beings do this all the time, don't we? We don't just distort reality and, and truth by lying. We, we try to escape reality. 
We try to escape responsibility, just like the sluggard. Now, there's lots of times, aren't there, when we need rest. We need to unwind. We need to step away from work. We have limits. We need naps. They're not sinful. But that is different to the way the sluggard behaves. We escape from reality in all kinds of ways, don't we? I think um, our phones are a big part of this. They are constantly calling out to us. We are all dopamine addicts this evening. And so often our phones, our devices, they, they, they pull us away, don't they, from Scripture, from prayer, from the kind of conversations we should be having with people we love. Escapism. For some men, I think particular hobbies can be a way of disengaging from family life, evading responsibility. Or can I, can I dare mention the T word? Days gone by, you and I, we had to wait a week, didn't we, to watch the next episode of our favorite TV program. Well, not now, Netflix, it just assumes we're going to watch it, even if it's half 11 at night, even if we've got work tomorrow. And so, friends, let the sluggard be a little bit of a warning to you, to me tonight. Learn from him. You know, you can gain a huge amount of wisdom just by observing other people, just by watching someone. The good news about that is it's, it's absolutely free. That's what this individual is doing in verses 30 to 34. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. Friends, let's consider these things. Let's consider the consequences. Don't escape, don't try to escape reality. Embrace reality. Embrace life in God's world as it really is. What does embracing it look like? Well, look at verse 27. Here's how the anti-sluggard behaves. Prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. And maybe you can see the contrast here. It's the contrast between working outside and then having a place to go inside. And the picture is of someone working hard now, sleeping presumably under the stars, so they can have something to enjoy at a later date. And the implication seems to be that in verse 27, if they build the house first, before they do all that preparation, before they do that work, they are going to be in financial trouble. And we could talk at length about the importance of preparation here in all sorts of aspects of life, maybe in, especially when we are, have big changes in life. But I think Proverbs is encouraging us to conform our lives to reality. Because the universe has rules. Life in God's world is ordered in such a way, if you go against those rules, there is going to be consequences. So, if you don't revise for an exam, you will fail the exam or fail to do as well as you could. If you treat a friend with disrespect, then eventually you will cross a line and you will lose that friend. If you always take the easy way out in life, you will ruin your life. And if you try and build a house before you've made enough money to pay for it, you will be bankrupt. And the wise person listens when healthier paths are suggested to them, are put in front of them. The wise person has learned, maybe through their own past folly, that they benefit from the counsel of others, that they know they are not the center of the universe. They know they don't have all the answers. And as they embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, as they embrace his wisdom, his teaching, 
they find they're on the path to blessing, the path to life. I started with a quote from T.S. Eliot, listened to another from Churchill. He once said, men, and men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. And that's so true, isn't it? It's so often the way. It's true in ordinary life. And it's true with the Lord Jesus too. So many people hear his words, they hear his wisdom, they hear him tell the truth to them about themselves, about their lives, about their sin. They stumble over it and then they just move on as if nothing has happened. That is true today. But it was also true when Jesus was on earth. Some heard his words and they were amazed, weren't they? But other people heard him speak and they just went away shaking their heads. What's he talking about? Soil or something like that? I don't know. And yet, what does Jesus say? Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Listen to Peter. He says, Jesus is the living stone. In him we are being built into a spiritual house. Now to you who believe this stone is precious... But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And so, friends, tonight, in a world that asks us, what is truth? You and I have got to listen to the voice of wisdom. We have got to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, he says to us, don't distort the truth. Speak the truth to one another. Don't try to escape reality. Embrace reality. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so may it be so for us, and may it be so for all those we love. Well, let's pray together.